Now, I saw a story in the papers this week that shocked me. The UK seems to be, it could be, cashless. Families are flocking to withdraw their funds. Britons are pulling money out of their savings accounts at the fastest rate ever recorded. New data highlights how people in the UK have accumulated £101 billion worth of debt since the start of 2023. Household budgets are stretched, of course, to battle the rising cost of living. So who better to talk to than Dr Roger Gavolb, former advisor to the Bank of England and the UK Treasury? Now, some of the statistics I've read about the amount of money that people are withdrawing from their accounts is quite shocking, actually, because during the pandemic, quite a lot of middle class people who kept their jobs working at home managed to accrue quite a lot of savings. Are we now spending those savings? Not necessarily. I mean, first of all, thank you very much. It's lovely to be back here. And I, I, feel, re have you. I feel really at home. I, I should perhaps be in the middle of these chaps because, I mean, you know, I'm a consumer champion, a people's champion, and where I belong is in between these two illustrious bookends. <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel really comfortable. You're the uh, filling in the sandwich. Well, that's, well no, I'm the, I'm the midway point, you know, between the two of them. Um, yeah, I think one has to be careful about statements quite as sweeping as that. There's been about, uh, well, if their figures are to be believed, because they aren't always, uh, the Bank of England announced 4.6 billion pounds withdrawn from savings in the month of May. But I think we need to remember that a lot of that is people paying down debt and mortgages and credit cards and other things because interest rates have risen so high. So they're not spending it and they're not cashless. They're just getting rid, they're shaking off some of that debt because it's become unnecessarily become so unnecessarily, in my view, become so expensive. But yes, we are spending a lot. 45% of people with mortgages, according to a study by one of the debt charities, if I recall it, Step Change, are having trouble meeting bills. And 4% of the entire British public, that's 68 million of us, are going to run out of money by the end of this year. Well, there we go. People are running out of yep. money. So it's not just paying down credit cards and debt payments and mortgage payments. People are being left with less and less and less and at the I, end of the month. And I hasten to add that those numbers were before the last interest rate rise, the 13th. Well, you've been very vocal about what you think of the Bank of England's decision to hike those interest rates again. You think it's the wrong decision and is having, well devastating impacts, could have devastating impacts. Yes, I've been saying this since the first rate rise. What we have is non-consumer driven inflation. We're not spending. People are choosing between heating and eating, aren't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. well, we're not overspending. It's not like the states where they, they have a, a trillion seven of money under the mattress from the pandemic. We don't have anywhere near as much. And they do have consumer spending and they have uh, uh, raised interest rates and it has more than half the inflation to less than 5%. Here, ours hasn't dropped at all. It just mm. keeps going up. And the Bank of England simply is now stuck in such a rut they can't admit it. What you do with this kind of inflation, which is called cost push, is let it run itself out because it comes from fuel and energy supplies and services. And indeed, food, food prices are dropping, fuel prices, energy costs are dropping. It runs itself out. In 2009, we had the same thing almost, and the Bank of England did not raise interest rates. But to do it 13 times is so out of touch, it's so insane, and the damage it's done to the property market, generation rent, the rental market, the bank of mum and dad, it's been devastating, and we haven't even seen the effects from this 13th rise. It's Totally insane. No. Uh, I understand that. And I'm sorry. I understand that Andrew Bailey is actually holding secret meetings with Stop Oil because he's under such criticism now that he's trying to learn how to glue himself to his chair at the Bank of England. <laughs> Breaking news there. I'll have to fact check that one in the break, Roger. I'm not sure that's true. But, uh, you know, he is in a sticky situation. Oh, 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 so there you go. I better <laughs> take that one sitting down. <laughs> Aaron, let's bring you in on this because we were just discussing in, in the break, weren't we, how the UK... We always talk about how we're one of the biggest economies in the world and that, you know, people want to come here from all across the world to, to make a living and improve their lives. But are we actually a poor country masquerading as a rich one? My view is that you take out the southeast of England, you take out London, the M25, we're, we're in many parts of the country, we're a middle-income country. You know, I was in Poland late last year and 
Frankly, many of their larger towns, smaller cities, feel more affluent than what we have here in the UK. Really? Very striking. You go to places like Krakow, Poznan, Katowice, they feel wealthier than places like Leeds or Newcastle. Just an observation, purely anecdotal, but that's how it feels, and some of the numbers back it up. In terms of this, uh, this data, I mean, is it a surprise when you've got the average savings rate is around 2.37%, but the average mortgage is 6.37%? Mm. So you've got no incentives to save. As we've already heard, you obviously have to spend a lot of money too. And this is really counterproductive on the, uh, on the workings of the Bank of England themselves, because one of the reasons why you increase interest rates, is I agree it's a stupid thing to do, is you obviously want to quell consumer demand. One way of doing that is, of course, you incentivize more people to save because they'll find a higher return on their savings because savings rates go up, but they're not going up. So we're in a really bad situation. And even though the Bank of England's done this with uh, interest rates, it's not feeding through to savers. A real mess is being made of the mm. whole situation, frankly. Yeah. Darren, you were itching to come in. I think even if the banks are and raised interest rates on savings to 10%, mm. that people wouldn't have savings to pop in their savings accounts, right? It's That's one the penny problem. up by 10%, isn't it? <laughs> and, is it? Do you know, uh, where I do agree with Aaron is that actually we need more houses to be built, right? We, ultimately, you're not going to bring down mortgage rates and actually increase the, the supply if we don't actually do that, because demand is through the roof. And many marginal landlords are just saying, I'm off. This is not working for me at all. Yeah. I'm not making any money from this. Goodbye. And renters in London especially are saying, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? Yeah. And then there are two really quick points. Lockdown, I don't think we're being honest about the extent to which that has made us poor, right? That, with the vast sums of borrowing, 100% of GDP, in large part, thanks to lockdown. Second point, America isn't in the same boat that we're in because America has energy independence. I'm afraid we're far too often listening to the likes of Aaron <laughs> and saying, we need more windmills and solar panels when actually we need what works and that is gas oil and dare I say wind, nuclear and coal. Is windmill the derogatory term for wind, a wind, well, wind I don't think we can call them anything oh, else. Oh Roger I want to come back to you but I don't have time. Oh. Gutted. We'll speak again. There